Hello and welcome to a new episode of Federma and Crew. This episode is the first in a series called Close Readings, where I seek to uncover the deep layers of meaning, structure, and significance in the literary texts that I cherish and care about. And since the channel is just getting started, I'd like to begin with our eponymous hero, Fadala the Parsi. Fadala is a marginal character in Herman Melville's Moby Dick, a product of the author's romantic orientalism, or the fascination with the East in 19th century American culture, Fadala is a harpooner of South and West Asian origins, with Zoroastrian roots, Indian descent, Persian genealogy, and Arabic etymology. Some suggest that Melville named him after a Fadai assassin, a 12th century revolutionary sect in present day Iran. Others believe Melville named him along the lines of Fazlullah, an Arabic name also common in Persian that roughly translates as the grace of God. We also know that in his travels to British ports as a sailor, Melville came across the Parsis members of the Zoroastrian community in India who first migrated from Iran following the Muslim conquest of the Persian Empire in the 7th century and finally settled in the present-day state of Gujarat. What we can say for sure is that Fadala is a collage of varied and variegated elements who perfectly suits Melville's idea of a multi-ethnic crew in Moby Dick. Before getting into specifics, let's go over a brief synopsis of Moby Dick. Published in 1851 and narrated in first person by the eccentric character Ishmael, the novel follows Captain Ahab and his motley crew on board a whaler named the Pequod. Driven by Ahab's obsession, they begin a journey round the globe to hunt down a legendary white whale named Moby Dick, who had, in the previous voyage, destroyed Ahab's ship and devoured his leg. The novel thus explores the themes of revenge, obsession, human nature, and human relations with nature. In the course of the plot, Ahab begins his hunt from the New England port of Nantucket and tracks down Moby Dick into the Pacific Ocean, where he confronts the whale in a battle that concludes with the destruction of the ship, the death of Ahab himself, and the entirety of the crew, all except for one sailor, Ishmael, Melville's narrator, who survives to tell us the tale. His tale, which is what makes Moby Dick a major American novel and a classical world literature, is not just about Ahab's obsession with the white whale. It is also about the whaling industry as an early capitalist enterprise. Ishmael also shares his knowledge on the operation of whaling vessels, the social hierarchies governing them, and the ordinary lives of the multi-ethnic sailors who worked on these vessels under the command of European and American captains and ship owners. Last but not least, Moby Dick is about the whales themselves, the marvelous creatures that were violently hunted down for natural resources during the heyday of the whaling industry. Ishmael has also been hailed as a liberal-minded hero, one who celebrates the individual freedom the whalers cherished away from the confines of polite society, and the ethnic diversity that existed on the vessels beyond the world riddled with racism and colonialism. In fact, Ishmael's best friend in the novel is Queen Quick a native of South Pacific Ocean and allegedly a cannibal with whom Ishmael has a complex and possibly queer relationship. Better to sleep with a sober cannibal than a drunken Christian, 
Ishmael tells us with much pride and enthusiasm. Yet, despite his progressive and tolerant personality as narrator, Ishmael deeply resents one particular sailor, Sadala. Because Ishmael, along with his crewmates, believes that Fedallah is the reason why Ahab has lost his moral compass, and it is because of the Parsi that Ahab is on his suicidal and destructive mission to hunt down the white whale. In this episode, I am going to challenge this view and provide a starkly different reading of Fedallah's role in Moby Dick. Firstly, this is how Ishmael describes Fedallah the first time he sees him. That her turban Fedala remained a muffled mystery to the last. Once he came in a mannerly word like this, by what sort of unaccountable tie he soon evinced himself to be linked with Ahab's peculiar fortunes. Nay, so far as to have some sort of a half-hinted influence. Heaven knows, but it might have been even authority over him. All this none knew. But one cannot sustain an indifferent air concerning Fedala. He was such a creature as civilized domestic people in the temperate zone only see in their dreams, and that but dimly. But the like of whom now and then glide among the unchanging Asiatic communities, especially the Oriental Isles to the east of the continent, those insulated immemorial unalterable countries which even in these modern days still preserve much of the ghostly aboriginalness of earth's primal generations when the memory of the first man was a distinct recollection and all men his descendants unknowing whence he came eyed each other as real phantoms and asked of the sun and the moon why they were created and to what end? Evident in this iconic passage is not just the deeply Orientalist language that relegates Fedala, the unchanging Asiatic, to prehistory, but also the possibility that the Parsi has supernatural authority over Ahab. Following his first appearance in the novel, when he jumps on the deck as Ahab's confidant, Fedala is the target of intense suspicion among the crew, and is particularly a victim of Ishmael's xenophobia. Fedala is considered to be Ahab's closest ally, responsible for the captain's descent into madness. The antagonism surrounding Fedala's role in Moby Dick has not been limited to Ishmael's narrative only. In fact, some early scholars of American literature who in the 1920s, revived Herman Melville from total obscurity in an effort to celebrate the Anglo-Saxon aura of the author against the tide of the immigrant masses changing the fabric of American society, began to read Moby Dick from the lens of a liberal democratic consensus. Accordingly, the narrator Ishmael was the embodiment of the American white liberal ethos, and Captain Ahab, was the corrupted soul who had succumbed to anti-democratic mania. And the multi-ethnic crew of the ship, as ordinary folk, stand in awe of this fateful dialectic between Ahab and Ishmael. While this interpretation has been subject to change and revision in the 20th and 21st centuries, especially since the novel is now being re-examined from anti-racist anti-colonial and environmentalist perspectives, there has always been a constant factor in this equation, one that doesn't change regardless of the reader's politics. And it's Fadala's destructive role. A critical establishment continues to believe, just like Ishmael, that Fadala is Ahab's Mephistopheles, the devil in disguise, who has enchanted uh, the captain, to have chased to the white whale until his last breath. To further highlight the problem, 
and hoping not to bore you with a review of past scholarship, I instead asked ChatGPT to tell me about Fadala's role in Moby Dick. And I found its answer not quite surprising. After all, OpenAI mines big data from accumulated knowledge, and the current consensus on Fadala, which informs ChatGPT's response, is, in my view, deeply flawed. In response to the question, what role does Fadala play in Moby Dick, ChatGPT responds, Fadala plays a mysterious and symbolic role in Herman Melville's novel, Moby Dick. He serves as Captain Ahab's harpooner on the whaling ship, Pequod. Fadala is a character of particular intrigue because of his enigmatic nature and the sense of foreboding that surrounds him throughout the story. So far, so good. Here are the key aspects of Fadala's role in the novel. Number one, mysterious and foreboding presence. Fadala's origins and identity are shrouded in mystery. He is described as a Parsi or a Zoroastrian, and his appearance and behavior suggest an otherworldly quality. This aura of mystery and the unknown adds to the novel's atmosphere of uncertainty and impending doom. Okay, missing in Chad GPT's first characterization is the subtle difference in any work of literature between the perception of a character from the perspective of the novel's narrator on the one hand and the explicit uh, reality of the character in question on the other hand. I argue that in Melville's mind, and thus for the perceptive reader who chooses to see beyond the fog of Ishmael's Orientalism, Fadala is a character not that mysterious. Number two, Ahab's close confidant. Fadala becomes one of Ahab's closest and most trusted confidants during the voyage. He is often seen as Ahab's sign, and their relationship takes on a spiritual and prophetic dimension. Ahab appears to view Fadala as a guide of sorts, especially in his obsession with Moby Dick. So, the first half of this statement is correct. However, by assuming that Ahab views Fadala as a guide in his obsession with Moby Dick, is to disregard the textual reality of the novel, as I will demonstrate, which reveals Ahab's skepticism rather than unwavering trust of Fadala's prophecies. Number three, prophecies and omens. Throughout the story, Fadala makes cryptic prophecies and omens related to Ahab's fate and the outcome of the voyage. His words are often seen as premonitions of doom, adding to the sense of impending tragedy that permeates the novel. True enough, Fadala's prophecy does carry a strong sense of doom and foreboding. But, as I will argue, they are meant to discourage Ahab from killing the whale, rather than goad him to do so. Once again, ChatGPT seems to have easily bought into Ishmael's account of the events, instead of minding the gap between Ishmael's voice and Melville's intention. Number four, fateful connections. Fadala's presence and influence on Ahab underscores the theme of fate and destiny in Moby Dick. Ahab's obsession with Moby Dick and his willingness to follow Fadala's guidance suggest that he sees their fates as intertwined and that Fadala may hold the key to the whale's destruction. This is by far the most problematic statement ChatGPT has mined regarding Fadala. While Fadala does provide Ahab with spiritual guidance and shows him the future, if you will, his prophecies do not hold the key to the whale's destruction. Quite the contrary. They are meant to save the Pequod from destruction. 
Here they have, as we will see, just wouldn't listen. Number five, tragic end. Fadala's role in the story comes to a tragic climax during the final confrontation with Moby Dick. When Ahab is killed in his harpoon attack on the whale, Fadala is entangled in the lines and ropes and dragged to his death alongside Ahab. This underscores the idea that his fate was inexorably linked to Ahab's pursuit of vengeance. This is true. In his prophecies and warnings, Fadala had made it clear that Ahab's pursuit of vengeance would lead to his death. What ChatGPT does not specify, as I have said a number of times, is that Ahab should have averted disaster as the Parsi asked him to. More on this to follow. In summary, ChatGPT concludes, Fedala is a mysterious and symbolic character in Moby Dick who adds an element of mysticism and foreboding to the narrative. His role is closely tied to Captain Ahab's obsession with Moby Dick and the theme of fate and inevitability that runs throughout the novel. Fedala's presence contributes to the novel's rich and complex exploration of human nature and the consequences of unchecked obsessions. In the remainder of this episode, I will provide a close reading of Fedala that unfolds against the grain of Ishmael's narrative. This reading also unravels the critical establishment shaped around Ishmael's point of view that has targeted Fedala as the incarnation of evil in the narrative. I argue that Herman Melville's actual intentions behind Fadala's role differ from popular and established opinion, and that in his desperate attempts to warn Ahab not to kill the whale, Fadala possesses a suppressed voice that can be marginally heard. I call this a proleptic narrative and predicated on a conversation between Ahab and Fadala in chapter 117 of the novel called The Whale Watch, happening shortly before Ahab's final encounter with Moby Dick. Let us read this short conversation, which, by the way, is the only time in the entire novel that we see and hear the two friends in a real conversation. So at the beginning of this exchange, Ahab wakes up from a dream, from a nightmare, and sees Fadala right in front of him, uh, ready to talk about the dream that he had just had. I have dreamed it again, said he. Of the hearses, have I not said, old man, that neither hearse nor coffin can be thine? And who are hers that die on the sea? But I said, old man, that ere thou couldst die on this voyage, two hearses must verily be seen by thee on the sea. The first, not made by mortal hands, and the visible wood of the last one, must be grown in America. Aye, aye, a strange sight that part. See, a hearse and its plumes floating over the ocean with the waves for the pallbearers. Ha, huh, such a sight we shall not soon see. Believe it or not, thou canst not die till it be seen, old man. And what was that saying about thyself? Though it must come to the last, I shall still go before thee, thy pilots. And when thou art so gone before, if that ever befall, then ere I can follow, thou must still appear to me, to pilot me still. Was it not so? Well, then, did I believe all ye say, O my pilot? I have here two pledges that I shall yet slay Moby Dick and survive it. And Fadala finally says, Take another pledge, old man, said the Parsi, as his eyes lighted up like fireflies in the gloom. Hemp only. 
کن کن دی در گلوز جیمی I am immortal then on land and on sea cried Ahab with a laugh of derision immortal on land and on sea both were silent again as one man the great dawn came on and the slumbering crew arose from the boat's button and ere noon the dead whale was brought to the ship okay so before we proceed you're welcome to read my article call me for that long reading a proleptic narrative in moby dick for a thorough version of the following analysis the whale watch is often treated as an inventory of Fedallah's three prophecies that foretell Ahab's fate as bound with the Pequod's destruction. What are these prophecies? Number one, Fedallah announces in the form of a riddle that upon encountering Moby Dick, Ahab shall witness two Perses, or funeral figures, elaborating this first prophecy he argues that neither hearse nor coffin can be thine. He further explains that of the two hearses, the first will not be made by mortal hands, referring to his own corpse that will be lashed to Moby Dick, and that the visible wood of the last one must be grown in America, referring to the Pequod's physical structure. Number two. The second and perhaps more inconceivable prophecy is that I shall still go before thee thy pinus, suggesting that I, Fedallah, will die first but shall re-emerge from the dead to pilot Ahab to his death, which is exactly what happens. Number three. Finally, the third and most foreshadowing of all is the chilling prophecy that hemp only can kill thee, referring to the whale line or the strong rope made of the fiber of the cannabis plant that will strangle Ahab to death. We must note that all three prophecies are fulfilled not simply because Fadallah foretold them, but as we will see, because Ahab denied them as pipe dreams despite Fadallah's insistence that they are true and that they have must change course. And this attitude really is the linchpin of the chapter. A mere focus on Fadallah's prophecies in the whale watch or simply assuming that he's goading Ahab to pursue Moby Dick will inevitably overlook the underlying rhetoric of the conversation. Namely, that Ahab, and please keep this statement in mind, must take another pledge. At the outset of the chapter, Ahab wakes up from his slumbers to find his companion Fadala beside him. Like the last men in a flooded world, clearly affected by this apocalyptic mood, the two engage in a debate revisiting Fadallah's prophecies. While Ahab is inclined to understate the chances of failure, claiming against long odds that victory is at hand, Fadallah, who is blessed with supernatural abilities, is certain of impending destruction. Opening the debate, Ahab recalls his past dreams involving the hearses of the first prophecy. In contrast to Ahab's verdict that the hearses will guarantee chaos and death, Ahab's own visions have convinced him that triumph is possible. Yet, in response to Ahab's arrogance, Fedala takes up a corrective tone that stays with him until the end of the dialogue. For instance, have I not said, old man, that neither hearse nor coffin can be thine? Asks Fadala, as he voices the first prophecy. When Ahab retorts that it is practically impossible to be hearsed on the high seas, 
Fadala elaborates that both hearses will no doubt emerge. He then extends the argument further into the second prophecy, foreseeing that he, Fadala, will rise from the dead to pilot, to guide Ahab down with him. Not disheartened by Ahab's mockeries, ha, such a soon we shall not soon see, Fadala pleads with Ahab, believe it or not, but I said, old man, that Moby Dick is destined to prevail. Even the third prophecy, which declares the strangling certainty of death by a whale line, and to which Ahab responds with a laugh of derision and cry of immortality on land and on sea, Fadala is convinced poignantly convinced that unless Ahab changes course, the Pequod is bound to sink despite the three prophecies that are issued to deter rather than seduce. It is believed that Melville modeled Fadala's prophecies after the three witches in Shakespeare's Macbeth. I, however, argue that unlike Shakespeare's witches, Fadala intends to discourage Ahab rather than to tempt him. Let me elaborate. As the witches appear before Macbeth in the fourth act of the play, they raise three horrid apparitions to issue three foreboding and ultimately destructive prophecies. Number one, beware Macduff, beware of the fane of Fife. Number two, be bloody, for none of woman born shall harm Macbeth. Number three, Macbeth shall never vanquish thee until great Burnhamwood to high Dunsinane Hill shall come against him. Fadala too, as we noted, has issued three major prophecies, but in offering a concluding piece of advice, he differs from Shakespeare's witches in that he mournfully stares into Ahab's eyes and right before informing him that death is imminent, warns him against Ahab's misreading of a dream. Take another pledge, old man. In short, Melville's Parsi prophet means to dissuade rather than gold. Take another pledge, old man. The imperative logic of the sentence distinguishes it from the flat descriptions of the character within and beyond the narrative. From the assertive mood of the verb take, to the beckoning of an alternative to Ahab's destructive vows in another pledge, to the imploring but unprecedented intimacy of the direct address old man, the climax of Fadala's argument proves significant to an alternative reading of Moby Dick. The nucleus of Fadala's sentence is the, is the phrase, another pledge. The two characters seem to have employed the word pledge in very different senses. Ahab's articulation implies a form of security for achieving a personal goal confirming his self-absorption. Following his unspecified dream of the hearses, and after his dispute with Fadala, Ahab is convinced that he has two imaginary pledges that he will be the victor in the battle ahead. Yet, in contrast to Ahab's egomaniacal pledges, Fadala's mandate for another pledge is more altruistic. Though convinced that his suicidal captain will steer ahead, Fadala summons Ahab to rethink the chances of triumph and avoid destruction. Unlike Ahab, who draws on his pledges to invoke a misguided security for success, Fadala's use of the word is more prophetic. With a full knowledge of the battle's outcome through two hearses and a pilot, as well as the specifics of Ahab's death by 
the end, the three prophecies, Fedala still finds it necessary to call on Ahab to stop misinterpreting the prophecies and avoid fabricating new ones to warrant illusions of self-grandeur. In other words, and as opposed to Ahab's vows, Fedala's invitation to another pledge translates into an oath of loyalty to the Pequod's security and common will, rather than his crewmate's destruction or Ahab's ambition. Revisiting the chapter of the chase, third day, at the end of which Ahab and his crew die, demonstrates how Fadala's beckoning could have proved life-affirming. Throughout this fateful chapter, Ahab sails across the terms of Fadala's prophecies, realizing hour after hour into the conflict that his own pledges are doomed to fail. A day after Fadala's disappearance, Ahab seems convinced that his Parsi companion was merely an imposter, a charlatan. But when hours later, when a corpse resurfaces as lashed round and round the fish's back, Ahab comes to realize that this, then, is the first curse that thou didst promise. However, rather than taking a second look at the half-torn body of the Parsi, trying to read his distended eyes turned full upon all Ahab as crying, perhaps, Take another pleasure, man. Ahab chooses to hold thee to the last letter of thy word, calling for the second hearse in disbelief. Still, in denial, and resolved to project Fadala's riddle as logically flawed, Ahab proceeds with the battle until brought to his senses at the moment of crisis. As Moby Dick turns to meet and destroy the Pequod, he finally finds the missing link, the ship, the hearse, the second hearse. Yes, a vessel made of American. And this is what the Parsi meant by American wit. Yet even then, Ahab refuses to remember the lesson of the whale watch. Rather than considering the possibility of the hemp prophecy, Materializing, since Fadala has so far been true to his words, Ahab clings to his own false promises yet again. I turn my body from the sun, he cries out in the last paragraph of his life, defying Fadala's prophetic authority. Having finally recognized the inevitability of the first two prophecies while refusing to accept the imminence of the third, Ahab still decides not to follow Fadala's final warning, but instead, and in a moment of self-annihilation, to sink all coffins and hearses to one common pool. In other words, Ahab's last sentence in Moby Dick is not, thus I take another pledge, but tragically, thus I give up the spear. The significance of Fadala's sentence goes well beyond the consequence of Ahab's actions. By simply following the Parsi's lead to take another pledge, Ahab could have returned his family in Nantucket, securing everyone's safety and also doing the marine ecosystem of our planet a great service. In addition, the imperative mood and warning tone of the verb take, predicating the sentence on its assertive another pledge, has a radical impact on the narrative at large. Compared with the call of the narrator's Call Me Ishmael, which by the way is one of the greatest openings in American literature, Fadala's take conveys a similarly self-contained statement that could extend the Parsi's influence throughout the novel. Take another pledge and Call Me Ishmael are both imperative statements that read prophetically. <clears throat> Ishmael's sentence opens a narrative 
to articulate the single existing account of an allegorical journey that has expanded the world over. Fedala's statement makes it clear that because he has been aware of the tragic outcome of the voyage, he requires Ahab's trust and authority to try to avert the tragic tide of events. Turning the wheel of fortune, then, the take of Fadala's sentence had the potential to influence Ishmael's destiny as sole survivor, and by extension, reshape the narrative itself. By taking another pledge of his own, Ishmael too could have conveyed a more tolerant and inclusive account of the journey. One in which the Pequod's crew mates, in all their diversity, could perhaps claim the right to speak and revolt against Ahab's ecomania. This alternative account of Moby Dick, I'd like to think, has a new grand opening. Call me Fedala. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this video, please subscribe and become a crew member. I would also appreciate your feedback. Perhaps together, we too could take another pledge. See you soon.